Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having the chance to be the second time here. I had the honor to speak last time to you as well. Uh, today I've grabbed out a topic about the challenges in a competitive uh, market, in competitive environment. This is nothing special because a uh, competitive environment is, is real. In the gambling industry, especially in the online market, you have enormous competition. But I wanted to drag it down to a situation which is very, um, very good uh, applicable here in Cyprus. I mean, with a competitive environment, if you work in a legal framework, we are very close, you have alternatives with completely different legal frameworks or none of them. So we have heard so many things about technology and artificial science and so on. So I felt a bit ashamed that I have a very primitive pre presentation with not, nothing science based, but let's go ahead. One of the biggest challenges still is the way we look at things. I mentioned that last year in my presentation in a workshop, if we touch something like here we see in a picture with the elephant, we perceive it totally different. And that has to do with, with our human nature. Our brain works that way, that we try to make things easier and to compare it with things we know. And we are confronted as a gambling industry with the situation that we are very often judged by, by certain parts people see. But on the other way around, it's the same story. If you look into the industry, and how re uh, regulation is perceived. I think then it is in that way around, it's exactly the same. I did never met somebody who said, hey, I am a, uh, thanks God, I'm in the regulated market. And very often we see, and I, I changed that expression a little bit, do we believe what we perceive? Because I thought talking about seeing would be not uh, very good if th those people are blind. Uh, or do we perceive what we believe. And I think the second one is very decisive. We have pictures in our mind, and according to those pictures, uh, we act and react. So, remember last year, I shown you a very short picture about the research we've done in Austria about the gambling habits of people in a gambling hall. And the very fascinating story was that it was a very simple question, do you know, or what do you think, how many people have at least one visit per week in a slot arcade? We have done this research because there was a new uh, legal framework in Austria. All the customers had to be registered and played with a mandatory player card. And so we had data about that story. And the estimation was widespread it from, you see, from 60 to 95%. Uh, even people who are working in the premises, uh, we still ask those things with, uh, with uh, companies I, I, I do a counseling. And all of us are in that area that we think that is very massive. But if you remember last time, the reality was here. About 5% of people were playing just a minimum amount, a uh, minimum uh, visit amount from once a week. So just to inform about the story about perception. Be aware in our industry that the majority of people like to gamble and uh, are doing it for fun and entertainment. That does not mean that we should not take our responsibility. But especially when I heard about the, the, the discussion about uh, AI and so on, I really liked the expression of Mr. Munro that he said, we cannot uh, uh, forget about the human interaction. This is very decisive if you talk about responsibility. And the good story is if the majority plays on a very healthy level, the people we have to, cl uh, take, a close, uh, to have, take a closer look at is a smaller group. The second is the dialogue between regulator and operator is decisive because uh, if there are created rules with the industry, these rules should, uh, should be brought into reality. It doesn't make sense if somebody creates a, a regulation or regulatory environment which is not applicable or not doable. Or on the other hand, which I often see in different markets, that the industry starts to generate uh, workarounds, that they start to define something totally different, just not to fulfill the legal framework. So it is very important, and I have the impression that you do it here in Cyprus uh, intensively. This discussion is very, very important. Then the regulatory framework should avoid or minimize problem gambling without creating an atmosphere of paternalism. 
I like to describe a, a perfect responsible gaming uh, framework like an invisible safety net. There is something here and you just realize it when you need it. And otherwise it doesn't disturb you or have any influence on yourself. And with competitive environments, uh, the empathy in approaching your customer is, is always essential if you approach customers, but here it's very a very delicate story because if you don't do that, the customers always, ha always have alternatives. And that makes it different, difficult, because if I try to convince a person, please have a closer look at your gambling behavior, do you think that is a healthy approach you, you have, have uh, gone here? And then people have the choice, okay, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I just cross the border wherever and play anywhere else. So I've chosen a system, uh, uh, an example from a gambling suspension in Switzerland. I've chosen this for, for two reasons. The first one is, uh, just to explain it, what it is about. They have a system with voluntary and involuntary gambling suspensions. First of all, they are valid indefinitely for all casino games and for the online market as well. The second is, they are entered in a national register, which is not a big issue, but here it comes. You can only, the ban can only be lifted on the, at the request of the suspended person, that would be fine, but they have to deliver following documents. They need an extract from the debt collection, regi collection register, they need to show pay slips, and they have to prove about assets, that, uh, that the gambling is affordable. That sounds very interesting, but as far as I remember, affordability has nothing to do with problem gambling because it is fine if I know that the person can afford gamble, but that is not uh, a story that brings you out of your responsibility that you say, no, he has money, he can gamble, even if he's addicted or she. And the third part that makes it much more complicated, an external certified specialist must be involved in determining whether the ban should, could, should be lifted. So this sounds really a very delicate procedure. If you make a self-ban, which is normal, a rational decision, and you have such a, a delicate procedure to go walk through uh, to lift your ban, if possible. So what, you will think, hey, what is the guy talking about? We don't live in Switzerland, what has it to do with us? But that example, I've uh, chosen because that is probably one reason for the next slide. Liechtenstein has quietly developed into a European gambling mecca. I don't know if you know it, about two years, two years ago, Liechtenstein started with operating casinos. Currently there are two open. Three uh, additional, and you know Liechtenstein is a very small country. You don't have 1.2 million people like here. You have 38,000 people in Liechtenstein. And Liechtenstein is sandwiched between Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. 2017, and that was the biggest, uh, uh, I think, reason for that development. The tax uh, budget was set about 3.3 million francs, but in reality, Liechtenstein has earned about 12 million francs in the year, in the first year. So. They became a little bit nervous and they said, let's increase the number of casinos. Currently there were two. Now there are three others in pipeline, but there are some internal uh, discussion because uh, people or residents from Liechtenstein don't really appreciate that development, that they become a mecca of gambling. But you see, very short, what is the funny thing? And here, uh, if you look at who is playing in Liechtenstein, 90 to 95 percent of people are coming from Switzerland. And before Liechtenstein was open, we had a similar situation for the Austrian market, which was close to Casino Bregenz, is very close to Switzerland. The German casinos bordered alongside of Switzerland. All of them had people who probably banned for a good or just for a self-rational reason, but they didn't want to declare themselves to reopen the ban. I've, I've used that example just to show you, be careful and full of awareness if you create the legal framework. And keep always in mind what will happen with the customer if he is affected with that situation. 
but to not to get, uh, get the impression that all people who are playing now in Switzerland are addicted people, I found one research from, Ms., uh, from uh, Dr. Lisha from the uh, University from Lausanne, and they did research over more than 15 years about uh, problem gambling in Switzerland, and they just had three casinos who participated in that, but only with these three casinos she found out that about 38% of those who did a self-ban are recreational gambler. We heard before with the, with the uh, presentation of AI, there was about 31% of people. The second group, a third of them are problem gamblers. Uh, they have three to five symptoms of uh, the DSM-4 criteria in that case it was and about 29% of dead players uh, who had a self-ban have pathological patterns. So, in the discussion about regulation and fulfilling those regulations, I found a model that could be probably helpful. I don't know who, heard, uh, who have heard about the model of the Golden Circle from Simon Sinek. Uh, if you want, afterwards, please, not during, during my presentation, you can Google that guy and listen to that, what he's talking about. But he showed a very simple model. model. He said, every decision-making process, it doesn't matter if it's an organization or an individual, has three different levels. He said from the, let's start here, the, and the side outside, with the what, what is just the process? What do you do and the result of why and the proof of that? The second circle, the how, is, uh, uh, is a specific action taken to realize your why. And the why itself is the purpose, why you do it. I've shown that because he mentioned that the inspiring people always start in the middle of the circle. They clarify the why and go then over the how to the what, how they bring it into real, in reality. And I've chosen that example for that reason. I'm traveling a lot and have to do with different countries, with different legislations. Some of them have nearly no regulatory frameworks for gambling. And if I ask people, what are you doing in the environment of responsible gaming? Sometimes I hear, yeah, that, that what we are forced to do. And sometimes we, I hear, we don't have to do that. And I'd like to mention that responsibility is not a question of a legal framework. It's a very ethical topic, and it should not be waited until any legislation says me what I have to do. Because then we come in a situation that even artificial intelligence cannot help us because if my approach is not the right one, that I understand that the sustainable business is only uh, uh, able if you act responsible, then we have a very difficult situation for our future. So finally, I'd like to go with that side. The price of greatness is responsibility. I hope you enjoyed this short presentation, and thank you very much for listening to me.